So we wanted to have this be a, um, an interactive uh, roundtable style uh, exchange. And I've asked all three of our speakers to come prepared to talk about two subjects. And the first one is about should we, as a government you know, of many different constituent parts, should we, make a sp is it, should we make a special effort now to better unify, to better integrate uh, our R&D efforts in the area of tuberculosis? And if so, why and in what critical areas and what are the concrete steps that we need to take? So we're going to start with uh, asking, we'll start with Tony and um, Eric, Peter, and uh, try and try and dig into that subject. And we'll take um, uh, a portion of our time to cover that. Um, and our second topic that we'll turn to is really about uh, one of the points made in the report and made in the paper that Peter uh, uh, was lead author on, which is about thinking, of, thinking strategically and long term about the need to build bigger and better long term platforms with emerging economies. are going to be found? And should that be a priority of our strategy? And if so, what is it going to take to make that happen? So those are the two, those are the two start off, the two questions that we're going to use as the frame here. Tony, would you like to lead sure. off on that first question? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I couldn't help but think when you, when you asked the question, and I actually just checked it on my iPhone, uh, of we go back because I've heard much analogies and relationships between the HIV effort and the effort which all of us would like to see done with tuberculosis. Uh, as an individual disease in and of itself and the obvious overlap with HIV. And at the end of about 20 years of a phenomenal effort that we put into HIV AIDS, my colleague and I, Greg Fokers at the NIAID, wrote a commentary in JAMA in 2001, and, and I entitled it just almost as if I was planning on this meeting, and it was the HIV AIDS pandemic, a model for diseases of other global health importance. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking specifically of TB as number one, malaria, and then neglected tropical diseases, which actually gets Right to your question, um, should there be a concerted effort in the arena of R&D? And the answer is yes, and be careful. Because mm -hmm. one of the things is that when I think about the R&D effort, I just have this picture in my mind, which I translate into slides of fundamental concept development all the way on the left upstream mm -hmm. through the early preclinical development understanding pathogenesis, developing a concept with the thought in mind of three interventions, diagnostic, treatment, mm -hmm. and prevention. And as you work your way from upstream to downstream, you get to phase one, you get to phase two, you get to early product development, advance the product development, and licensure. So when you look at that spectrum, the answer is if you take it as a whole, yes, we could benefit from unification, coordination, a lot of which we're doing, mm -hmm. but we're doing it in a way that I think is very productive, but that we could benefit from doing it better and doing it a little bit more intensively. The only caveat that I have about attempts in other arenas to unify, coordinate, develop some czar that's on top of it all is that that gets pretty dangerous when you're doing the concept development and the fundamental research because that almost invariably gets in the way of that spontaneous creativity that you need. But as you go further upstream, clearly you want to synergize and utilize all of the possibilities mm -hmm. that are available. So mm -hmm. you said three minutes, I'm at three minutes, may summarize by saying that I think it is a good idea depending upon what stage. When I wrote that article 13 years ago, I was referring to the entire spectrum. And as mm -hmm. I said, early on, you still need new concepts, investigator-initiated ideas that don't need to be coordinated. Once you get into the line towards developing something, then it becomes more and more productive to do that. Thank you. Eric? Well, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here with my friends and colleagues, mentors of, uh, uh, for this discussion. Um, 
I think that the importance of coordination at all levels is, has been echoed all day today in many of the discussions. But I think that we have underemphasized the real importance of coordination at the ground level. Uh, we can be coordinated in Geneva, Washington, where we really need to converge our effort is uh, at the country level uh, and holding our colleagues in country responsible for the planning and implementation elements of putting uh, and realizing uh, the benefit that the science affords but needs to be put to ground in a program so individuals who are burdened with the disease mm -hmm. can take advantage of it. I think that we need to take that to heart and look at what are the elements that we currently have in our toolbox to support that definition of the problem, the um, ability for us to define and understand the geomapping of where the populations are in each country, how that country's medical delivery system does or does not interface with those populations, and are they able to identify, enter, and retain those individuals in care over the duration of what is, in the case of TB, a cure intervention? Uh, we're not talking about a long uh, period on antiretroviral drugs like with HIV, but we have a disease here that we know how to prevent, we know how to diagnose it, and we know how to treat it to cure it, but we are unable to put that machinery in place to kind of orchestrate and ensure that impact. Yeah. yeah, so let me just make two quick points. I mean, I think the first is that uh, we're at a critical juncture in global TB control, and, and this is a juncture in which research and development is particularly important. I mean, we heard it from Mario, and I don't think you can say it better. You know, 56 million people treated, 22 million lives saved. I mean, that's an enormously successful enterprise. And yet, this TB situation is evolving rapidly with the drug resistance, TB, HIV, other comorbidities. We've got migration. We've got increasingly complicated health systems. And so if we don't move with the epidemic, we will not uh, get on top of things. And, and I think the, the, that we desperately need innovative tools and we need new approaches. And, and, and what's great is that uh, after decades of neglect, I think we're starting to see some really remarkable progress. And I think if we look at what the NIH has done, the funding is bringing in some of the brightest young minds using the coolest technology. And this is really transforming the field. Equally importantly, we're looking at public-private partnerships who are taking that knowledge and turning it into products which are already affecting people's lives. And I know that because when I was in India for a couple of years, I met people whose lives were literally saved by the gene expert. I think the second point that I would make is that the U.S. has, well, I'll just say it, we've always been the unsung hero in global TB control, and I think that we are poised to actually drive global efforts to modernize TB control. And, um, and you know, in the report, it's pointed out that almost 60% of the world's R&D is funded by the United States. And I think that's fantastic. I think that's an incredible, incredibly good investment. Uh, what we've seen from that are a number of new diagnostics, two entirely new drugs. We're seeing a, a growing pipeline of vaccine candidates. Uh, I'm super excited about PAMSI. This is a, a new drug regimen which, uh, which will, within five years we, of launching the phase three trial, we will know whether this is going to be able to change the lives of hundreds of thousands of people with drug-resistant TB. And if I could just make the one specific recommendation is I think that we all need to really rally behind that phase three trial and fully fund it as quickly as possible because this is a truly transformational progress. So if you were, try, if, if you were trying to, to make the case uh, to the White House that the R&D issues are at prioritizing, giving visibility, giving energy, better coordination and unity of effort at the right stage, and, and what would you, what would the case look like? How would you make the case to a political leadership that 
the R&D sphere is an area where we already are in a strong leadership position, where the returns are there and the U.S. national interests have, have reached a point where you could, you could feel comfortable making that case. You're so, asking me? Yeah, what do you think, John? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I've been talking about for a really long time. Yeah. Uh, multiple times a year in testifying before the Congress, multiple times in testifying before the administration everywhere from the department level up through and including the White House and OMB. You know, and sometimes it's not on the radar screen that you'd like it to be on, but when it is, it's the time to jump on it. And I, the argument I make from the standpoint of the U.S. government is that something that we, we really began to realize in its full form when HIV came along, and that is that we live in a global community and we cannot just think of other people's diseases and our disease. Mm -hmm. um, and it's more than just humanitarian, it's enlightened self-interest, it's economic, it's security, mm -hmm. it's all the things that many people in this room have spoken about. And I bring uh, examples of the extrapolation of how we went from fundamental basic research to extraordinarily dramatic interventions that anybody and everybody would agree have been uh, essentially game changers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we should use the HIV story not in a competition with TB, but as a phenomenal example of what you can do when you make an investment of basic research through early clinical research, through product development. I think the, the, the drugs that have been developed over the years for HIV, um, they just speak for themselves. That's the first thing. The other point that I make is I use the issue of the history of vaccinology with diseases that have now disappeared. I mean, the obvious one is, is smallpox and hopefully soon polio, mm -hmm. but also what we did not too long ago with some fundamental basic science observations and development with the conjugated Haemophilus influenza B vaccine, which went from a disease which was the leading cause of bacterially related deafness and mental retardation to disappearing. Yeah. I mean, see, those are the things that they listen to, things disappearing. They don't like things lingering. <laughs> they like things disappearing. <laughs> And I think the point that in Eric- In four years. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, depending on who I'm talking to, it either has to happen in two years, four years, or six years. Um, but I think the point that, uh, that Eric made is a good one, because the thing about TB that we can really argue for is that you can cure it. You can actually cure it. And that's the reason why there's a lot of activity right now talking about vaccine and cure for HIV. Because those are the ones that are the showstoppers. You mm -hmm. cure, you don't have you know, mm -hmm. 35 million people that you need to keep on therapy forever. You get a vaccine and then you turn the d dynamics of the epidemic around. Those are the kind of arguments you make, that there's an end game here. It's not just give us more money and check with me in a few years. It's we're gonna put an end to something that's an extraordinary plague. Eric, you have any thoughts about the argumentation? And the atmosphere. I mean, what I hear from Tony is that there is a, an excitement around the return to a much more scientific focused discussion around HIV. It creates an opening. People have an appetite and an openness to talking about these issues in a new and different way. As Peter was saying, you've got, you've got uh, options in development that you can push hard on that are specific and concrete. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I would really emphasize uh, what Tony's saying. Um, I think that the political, our political colleagues have different metrics and different pressures on them to produce. Um, we, uh, and I think that Tony was really uh, central in this uh, kind of epiphany that occurred, where scientists began a different dialogue with HIV, with pol the political elements in our country, that resulted in accelerating our ability to take a scientific finding, a discovery, uh, to uh, the uh, individuals that would benefit from it. And I think we saw in HIV the convergence and orchestration, as Mario was saying, 
of the critical role that civil society plays in facilitating that glide path. It takes all of it, and without any one component, we cannot put program on ground to benefit those that are suffering or dying from the disease that we now may have an understanding that has true application that can drop morbidity and mortality. I think TB is a frustration in that we have had answers to many of those questions for a very long time, but have been unable to move it to uh, benefit those who carry the heaviest burden of disease. 33% in India is a shocking statistic. Uh, you know, Peter's been there for the last few years trying to understand on a more granular level what are those bottlenecks that prevent um, the uh, benefits that we already have identified from being realized. Um, and it's the orchestration and all of those components that need to converge at, in the same time period to make it happen. I think our inability to turn up the volume on the elements of implementation that allow you to put program on ground, from my perspective, remains the rate limiting step. Joanne alluded to, what's the rate limiting step? The rate limiting step is really not the science. Uh, it's uh, not having models or examples of high impact or efficacious interventions. It's the variety and variation in the substrate you can use in any given clinical community medical delivery system interface that allow you to put that program in front of the person who needs it when they need it on every day that they need it. Uh, and I think TB has evaded our ability to pull those all together to have the impact that we know we can produce. The political will is critical. Without it, it stops. The science, without it, it doesn't happen. The community orchestration, without it, we do not uh, uh, have the uh, feedback loop created that comes back to both the scientists, the providers, and the political layer to continue, maintain, or change, augment, discover something new that allows the changing needs of that population to continue to be addressed. Let's shift and talk a bit about the emerging, emerging economies and the, the, we've posited in the paper and in the, in the, in the uh, summary paper and uh, the overview and in the R&D paper that Peter led on that it's important that we think long term about building, building research partnerships and platforms in those key uh, and those key emerging economies, which are a heavy burden. Peter, can you talk a little bit about that and what is it going to take? What, if, we, if we agree to that proposition, what is it likely to take? It's not like we're starting from scratch by any means. Well, first of all, let's recognize they're one and the same, right? The emerging economies are all high burden TB countries. Mm. You just take India, China, and South Africa and you're talking already about uh, roughly 40% of the world's TB and, and maybe 60% of the world's drug resistance. So, um, but I think we have to give them credit for more than their disease burden. I think what we're seeing is that there's, uh, they have increasing R&D capacities, they have growing science and technology budgets, they are increasingly seeing themselves as leaders on a global stage and, and showing leadership, in, in particular, I think, uh, some on TB. Um, I, I think that uh, the key is really to foster local expertise and platforms, and, and we've, it was mentioned several times today, and I think what we just have to really double down on our efforts to increase the R&D capacity amongst key partners, these emerging economies, uh, these are not short-term projects, you know, we have to make long-term commitments, nothing less than a decade. Mm. But I think that if you do that, uh, you will bring in some brilliant new minds. I think you will find that R&D is much more locally relevant. The products are likely to be much more frugal and globally applicable. And I think ultimately you're going to bring in the support of the company, countries themselves uh, to sustain it. Uh, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Peter said. Um, we found, at, at, from my perspective that I operate in as the director of an institute, that the interaction with low-income and, to some extent, middle-income 
countries that don't yet have a research capacity that are really in their own incipient mm -hmm. stages, we can get a lot done by helping build up that capacity as well as back and forth training. With the BRICS countries, it's a, it's a different experience mm -hmm. and it's actually a very uh, uh, ener ener energizing experience. It's, 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 it's something different because you have in those countries some really, really good people who really need the collaboration. I and mean, we've done it in, in three separate ways. One that I think the audience is familiar with, the Report International, which is the regional perspective on <coughs> observational research in TB, which involved the countries that Peter mentioned. It's an observational cohort study, but it really kind of opens the door to two separate approaches that we've been taking that are synergistic. One is to take our intramural scientists and develop country to country and individual to individual collaborations where we have people in Brazil, in South Africa, in China, in India, in South Korea doing development as fundamental as basic to screening drugs to developing clinical trials. And we also have a program now where we're funding uh, extramural investigators in an interesting way of collaborating that's somewhat novel, and that is instead of funding our investigator to go to one of those countries or giving money to do work here that's relevant there, we make a deal with the country in question. And we have this with China, we have this with others, in which the Chinese funded investigator, we fund an investigator, so we both have skin in the game, but we're working on a collaborative project. And that's really been very successful, and I think that's the kind of thing that's gonna lead to enduring results and enduring collaboration. So I, I totally agree with what Peter said. Eric, what are the political obstacles, do you think? And I mean, we know that we've seen the sensitivities around Russia, right? I mean, it's the complications of trying to make sure in the midst of a very turbulent situation that you, that you don't sacrifice those standing relationships. And we're seeing, you, the nature of this is that you're gonna have sovereign sensitivities, you're going to have tensions. You're gonna have to build, a, anticipate those and deal with those as you, as you work ahead. How do you do that? Well, I think the, um, the long, I think you have to have a familiarity on part of the political leadership with the uh, challenges that are present in the healthcare delivery uh, systems that they are responsible for. Um, I, I think that comes from activities like the uh, co-principal investigator, Mm -hmm. one in one country, one in another country, working on a common project. It comes in uh, elevating the uh, scientific investigation uh, agenda in the political uh, uh, campaign, political uh, party uh, that comes from a grassroots understanding of the importance of that for themselves, for their children, for their people. It, uh, it is almost as if a light bulb goes off for some leaders in countries where they realize that uh, these, this is their electorate and that if their electorate isn't healthy, uh, that it impacts their political uh, viability, longevity. Uh, but it is a, it is a, uh, it is a, a threshold has to be reached on part of that political leader where they realize that they are the individual who's responsible for investing in their people through health and education. And I've seen it in country after country. If that understanding is not there, uh, you're often talking to a, uh, an individual who doesn't take your information and move with it. Uh, it's a delicate convergence of uh, of information, understanding, pressure, and fear that I think has to be generated in that political um, leader to, uh, to act. Uh, it, it comes from the World Health Organization, the United Nations, making these issues important and relevant. It comes from our ability to describe that with epidemiologic surveillance data that is not at one point in time, but continuous. The 17 years that Mario showed on the reports allowed us to have high levels of uh, 
uh, confidence in saying that this is where we are at this moment in time with all of the problems in uh, sampling errors. And, um, and it then takes somebody close to that political leader to translate the jargon into here's the bottom line, common sense uh, uh, act that you need now to put in play. Uh, it is rare that a political leader, even political leaders coming from medical backgrounds, see the uh, political utility of focusing on the health of its population. It's not the first thing they think of. Uh, and I think it takes that ongoing narrative to get them there and keep them there. Thank you. Um, we're going to turn to the audience for some comments and questions. Uh, we're thrilled to be joined today by Debbie Burks, the new uh, Global AIDS Coordinator. Deborah, thank you for joining us. If you care to offer any comments, uh, we'd welcome that. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, but since you're here, maybe you'd like to <laughs> say a few words. <laughs> However. And then behind you, I think, Tiaji, did I see you? Yes, yes. So, Deborah. Well, <coughs> excuse me, I just flew in, so I just came to support this illustrious panel. So, um, they're all mentors of mine. We just came from South Africa um, with our annual meeting, and the, the gap even among the TB identified and in clinic patients between them and access to ART is still a phenomenal gap. Because it's not an we no longer have the excuse of not having the patient. The patient is in the clinic. It's getting patient is getting dots every single day. Yet they've not been tested for HIV and they're not receiving ART. And that gap is between about 45 percent as a mean to about 80 um, percent coverage. So there's still. Even though we have the patients and we've had that dialogue, we still have that gap. So from my perspective, from where I sit, that's still inexcusable that we have that gap. Now, when Ambassador Goosby took over, that gap was huge. It was more like only 10% or 15% were on ART. But with the new WHO guidelines, 100% should be on ART. So that gap is quite compelling for us. And we're, we worked very hard in discussing that and what we need to do. So, Sometimes you can have all the tools and all the knowledge and all the ability and you still have this programmatic piece as Ambassador Goosby was saying. So I think we still have our work to do to even implement what we're supposed to be doing right in this very moment. Um, the gene expert pieces in South Africa, we heard report after report that there's a backlog of about 50,000 um, mm. diagnostics that have not led to patients being treated. So the, the samples have been run but the patients have not been, have not, and then they had MDR and they have not received MDR treatment. So I think sometimes we, our technology is superb, but we don't often follow that with program. And I think we have to ensure that as we roll out these really amazing instruments that we have the program behind it to ensure that that happens. So it was, um, it was a great meeting. We had our annual PEPFAR meeting, but it was also still showed that we have a lot of work to do um, together. Thank you. Tiaji, other hands. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Tiaji Salam Blyther. I'm with Congressional Research Service. I just want to say I'm such a DC nerd because I'm so excited to be in a room with the current and former <laughs> ambassadors of uh, PEPFAR, so it's just like exciting. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> thank you for being here. So, um, I, I would like to say I want to thank um, Ambassador Goosby for mentioning something that I think, I don't know if it kind of, he kind of said it so smoothly, I don't know how many people picked up on it, and it's the health systems piece. I think part of the reason we're seeing such a challenge with TB is because if any of us who've been out in the field know most, much of the uh, resources, the health resources are concentrated in the cities and in the major cities and in the capitals. And uh, TB is a problem that obviously hits the, the more um, vulnerable people. So when you get to the rural areas and when you get to the peri-urban areas, there's a lack of diagnostic capacity as well as human resource constraints. I wanted to ask the panel, since this is about R&D, what type of field-based research is happening um, that may excite us, like maybe how we, we've seen the use of vinegar to detect possible um, uh, cancer in, in women, if, if we could possibly talk about something like that, some uh, low resource research happening in the field with TB. 
also not just in terms of uh, clinical research, but also operational research, how we may be able to get around basic diagnostics in areas with human resource constraints and diagnostic constraints. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take one, one other in this round. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, it's working. It's working. Okay. Uh, Peter Hale, Foundation for Vaccine Research here in Washington. Um, I, I think we all agree that political leadership and political will is, is, is critical, as Eric said. But uh, uh, so, so I, I'm very concerned that there seems to be a disconnect between the administration and Congress on increased funding for TB. Uh, a special concern is a recommended budget cut of 18% by the administration for USAID. It's not just USAID. What do we do about that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who would like to start off? There's a couple of different questions on the table. Peter? Well, I, I take the health systems issue. You know, I, uh, maybe it was 20 years ago, but when I was uh, doing NIH-funded research, I thought that few things could be as complicated as the mycobacterial genome. And uh, having spent two years in India, I'm uh, sobered by the, <laughs> the complexity of health systems. And I, and I spent months really just in putting my, my head in the space of the patient who's sick and poor in India and, and the, the completely insufficient choices that they're faced with. And, and from that perspective, uh, and, and, and I think uh, Debbie mentions it as well, when you actually look at the realities on the ground, you wonder how anything is actually happening. And, and, and it's possible to get incredibly depressed, and I won't say there aren't many days that I was, but, but for me, the, the kind of the focus on implementation science, implementation research, how do we roll these things out here? How do we change those anecdotes to data and then track that data and actually hold ourselves accountable for it? And I'll just mention one project I'm super excited about, and that are standardized patients. So uh, beginning in a few months, we'll be having about 400 trained uh, patient encounters in uh, Mumbai and in Patna, two big Indian cities. These are people who go in and say, you know, I've been coughing for like three weeks and I'm coughing up blood, you know, what should I do? And the shocking data that comes out of that is that only 8% of the doctors are even talking or thinking about tuberculosis, right? So this is enough to make a person who's spent their whole life in TB completely morose. And then you think, well, but at least we have something to track now. We know what the challenge is. So, so I do think that this issue of implementation uh, science is, is really critical and that uh, rather than getting depressed by the early results, we just look at like how much easy, how, how, uh, what a low hurdle we've got for ourselves right now. Eric, do you want to speak to the issues around programmatic, what Deborah was arguing about? Well, it's, it's really gratifying to hear the current global aid Ambassador, uh, speak to uh, the undone part of, uh, of this effort because uh, it is going to take that kind of intellectual honesty on part of uh, our USG effort, but also our colleagues uh, in the multilateral sector, but mostly our colleagues in country and the ministries of health to look at what they're doing, what they aren't doing, Eric. Sorry, I'm not working. Oh. Um, and to um, uh, be willing to uh, ask for uh, the technical assistance to put the program in place. We need to be able to re be ready to respond to that request um, in a way that allows for a sustained relationship uh, to capacity expand that ministry uh, or that planning body and country, it may not be the ministry in other settings, uh, to implement. And so I really want to echo the importance of that. There are many efforts that PEPFAR has already initiated trying to look at the elements of uh, identification, entry, and retention of individuals over time. Uh, both Zambia, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, South Africa have uh, uh, at uh, kind of the site level uh, studies going on that will give us insights into where those bottlenecks are. Uh, I'm old enough to know that the solutions often are idiosyncratic and country specific, almost site specific. So a one size fits all approach is not going to work, but what we need to do is to uh, support, nurture, uh, and create that creative mind in the country who's there all the time 
who sees a new wrinkle on a problem, but has the ability to take that in, fold it back out with a solution. Uh, we need to be in a supportive role, uh, but a constant role with it. It's not going to happen with a two-week technical assistance visit. The question that Peter raised about the um, budget cuts and the gap between Congress and ministries, I mean, the, the, the bigger problem, it seems to me, is that we're in a constrained budgetary situation in which there's going to be further tightening and, and, and it's going to be more difficult looking forward. And there's just many competing priorities, right? There's many right. good work to be done. And uh, so TB is competing, right? It's competing against a whole right. bunch of other things. So how do you think about that? Right. And how do you proactively energize and make sure that, that the priorities are, in aligned, are aligned with what you think right. is really important? Well, uh, Steve, I'm glad you asked that question because we're, we're, when you talk about R&D, it's a different picture than the, than the question right. that was just asked. Right. Because when it's R&D, I mean real research, and real development, it, TV isn't a line item. So I think what people don't appreciate is that it, the administration or any, the Congress could not, unless they do something extremely unprecedented, cut TB research. The, the perverse aspect of what's going on with a flat budget is that you can't take advantage of scientific opportunities that are more intense in TB now because we're in such an incipient phase. We felt so far behind. When I became director of NIAD a really long time ago, <laughs> the budget for TB I thought was a typo. Uh, it was like $600,000 for two grants that we had. It's now $165, $170 million. And the reason we were able to do that is because when the research, and I'm talking not about TB implementation and USAID, I'm talking about the fundamental NIH type research. As the NIH budget increased dramatically over years, from the usual, the NIH budget doubles generally every 10 years from 1998 to 2003, it doubled in five years, that when it increases, you have a lot of flexibility in jumping on scientific opportunities. So I have a slide, Steve, that you've seen that has what we do is balanced by the scientific opportunity and the public health imperative. So right now, TB is smacking with scientific opportunity and public health imperative. So I was able to do a lot of pushing towards TB research without hurting anybody else because there was an increase in the NIH budget, particularly during the doubling years when we used to get 14, 13% per year increase. For the last 10 years, the NIH budget has been flat. So with a two plus percent inflationary index, we have lost in the last 10 years 25% purchasing power. The budget that I had to defend before the Congress last month and the month before was a 0.7% increase for NIH. So it isn't that I'm going to cut anything. It's just that I have no flexibility to jump on opportunities with TB research unless I, OK, you pick it. I was at an influenza meeting before I came here. Should I tell the influenza people we're not going to go for a universal flu vaccine? I, I'm, I'm talking a little bit longer than I usually do, but I just want to make the point. The solution is one, no, I didn't say the solution. A solution, in my mind, is to change how we in this country think about innovation and research. It is part of the discretionary bucket of our budget, which means that it doesn't keep up with inflation during difficult times. And I have been arguing with somewhat deaf ears, except for a few people who are starting to listen now, some good people in, in the Congress, that if you really value innovation as part of an important part of, of ourselves as a nation, that innovation, and particularly in the biomedical sciences, but also in the physical sciences, should be a set formula like cost of living increases on the paycheck. So that if you have an X 
percent of inflation, biomedical research inflation is 2%, add 2 to 3% on that, and make it almost automatic so you don't spend time arguing about it. But we're not there yet. So I think the only way you're going to be able to have flexibility in taking advantage of scientific opportunities, if you have even a modest increase in the biomedical research budget. I'm not saying double the NIH budget every five years, because that's non-sustainable over mm -hmm. decades. But what is sustainable, and we've proven it, is a modest increase each year to keep up with inflation and to take advantage of opportunities. That's how I think we're going to meet the scientific challenge. Other comments? I'm just going to also invite Mario to offer a thought, and then David has his hand up. Mario, do you want to offer a thought? Not easy after this, because this is very clear, but uh, it's just to emphasize once again what I said before. Without new tools, we are not going to get to that level of ambitious targets that, uh, that have been uh, highlighted in the new strategy. That, that is very clear. And this is based not on speculation. It's based on the fact that, as we well know, the maximum ever reached in uh, TB is what was reached in the Netherlands or in some other countries of Europe, a bit in North America. I believe it was not 10 percent. It was li slightly less, 7, 8 percent. In the 50s and 60s, when uh, the new chemotherapy became available, when there was access, access, and that's why we insist so much on universal coverage and social protection. These were all elements that were put into, especially the European uh, portfolio of the governments, you know, social protection, universal coverage, and things like that. That is when the maximum possible 10% decline was reached. Now we know that this is going to be very difficult and a challenge in BRICS because they dominate, Peter said it again, but they dominate tuberculosis. 45% uh, uh, are in the, of cases are in the BRICS, two-thirds of MDR are in the BRICS. So uh, um, in, in these countries, it's going to be very difficult to reach something that is near 7, 8, 9 percent as it was in Western Europe or in North America half a century ago. We need new tools. That is very clear. So the, investment, the investments have to be presented in that, uh, in under that logic. I believe the U.S. government cannot do it by itself because we just heard the difficulties in getting more money. Here you need a major investment in basic research that has been underlined. Uh, you need a pipeline that is constantly like the HIV pipeline. You know, if, uh, if you, I, I open a parenthesis here. If I look at HIV, I came to, the, to this country in 1984 to train. So at the time, we didn't have the HIV test. The AIDS was described in 1981, if I recall. In 1983, 84 is, no, more uh, after that, 85 is when the HIV test became available because I got a needle stick and I was tested in 85, right. I remember. Eight, ACT was available in 1986, 87. So four or five years after, we had drugs, we had the test, we had everything, you know. And 15 years after, we had the triple therapy, as it was called at the time, heart, and so on and so forth. So that means that if you invest, you can achieve. Now, AIDS is probably different from TB. I think it's less complex in certain, certain ways. But it's, more, it's, 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 it's something that you can address if you invest. If you don't invest, if you maintain the status quo, it's going to be very difficult to progress in a, in a rapid way. And so again, it's an appeal that perhaps the leverage issue that was raised uh, with the BRICS, because they have major institutions, uh, and the technical assistance that can be given to improve further, uh, the mobilization of resources from other entities, for instance, the European Commission, $27 million is what they spend every year in the Horizon 2020 project now, $27 million. That's what we are talking about. The Gates Foundation spend 150, 160. NIH, we just heard the 160, 170. So that cannot be. So it's really an, an issue of mobilization of uh, opinions and uh, pushing, pushing others using the leverage uh, that the United States can have in, in order to really uh, get to the point that we need to get to, because otherwise it's not going to work, in my view. Thank you. David Bryden. Yeah, David Bryden with results. I mean, I think this is a really urgent discussion. I think we should find it morally offensive that we're out distributing medications that, yes, save people's lives, but mm -hmm. cause psychosis and hearing loss, permanent hearing loss. Um, that we should find morally problematic. So this investment that Mario is talking about is just extremely important. I want to just uh, differ a little bit, and correct me if I'm wrong, with Dr. Fauci, but I think that the reduction for USAID would impinge on R&D resources in the, in the sense that 
USAID is tasked with providing funding for late stage trials. So that would constrain the amount of money, as I understand it, for late stage trials for the PAMZ combination, for instance, or for the stream trial, uh, or other medications that would be much faster acting um, and would not cause psychosis and, and hearing loss. And so I think that it is an important point. I don't know what the, the strategy is. I'm not sure it makes the best sense for USAID uh, <coughs> to be tasked with those late stage trials if, if right. its funding is gonna be cut in this way, but I'd question. be interested in your reaction and you know, also children. I mean, when we talk about the, um, the interest of the administration, maybe that's the answer. What do we do about this? Maybe we emphasize the impact of TB on children and the need for medications and vaccines that will address their needs and, and get them diagnosed and treated and cured. I was going to uh, just comment on the, uh, the role the diplomatic uh, side of things uh, plays. Um, th the reason that the Global AIDS Coordinator had an ambassador title was really because uh, in every relationship that uh, PEPFAR had uh, in moving into countries, 36 in a big way, 78 total, it really comes in through a relationship of one country through another. And I think that uh, there is a growing appreciation of the uh, opportunity that a diplomatic discourse affords in that bilateral relationship. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Debbie and uh, the State Department with uh, Leslie Rowe's office, uh, the Global Health uh, Diplomacy Office, uh, is learning how to better prepare our AIDS ambassadors, uh, our, all of our ambassadors to be AIDS ambassadors in each of the country settings, uh, and take a leadership role in making sure the disease is understood, the prevention and treatment opportunities are understood, and as Robert was saying earlier today, uh, that that happened at the embassy level, uh, orchestrated through our agency uh, networks and country, but with a new and invigorated dialogue with country leadership, ministries of health mostly, but also civil society, to crystallize uh, the uh, advantages and the gains that can be won uh, with putting the science that's known on the ground. Our relationship with that effort needs to be increased, strengthened, as not a primary implementer as the United States, but as a partnership. And I think that's really right in front of us right now. Peter, Tony, did you care to? No, I agree. Uh, you had one more intervention. Speaking too much, but there is one issue that has not been faced. We talked a lot about governmental structures putting money into Gates Foundation because yes. Peter is there. What's the strategy for the industry? We are learning a lot of interesting thing now with expert monopoly de facto and uh, you know push down the price push down thanks to again US government and Gates Foundation and Unity. Uh, we are learning now from the two new drugs that after 40 plus years have been made available, Bedaculin and the Lamanid, both obviously developed by industry. Um, there is no other uh, uh, major development uh, uh, entity except for the TB Alliance that is now working on the, the new regiments and so on, but what's the strategy? Shouldn't we think about, again, a strategy with the industry? I think in 2009 there was the uh, uh, Pacifical Summit where there was a purpose of, a name there was that of gate in getting the industry involved. Uh, I think that in TB uh, we have a major challenge there because that is um, probably the most unattractive disease that uh, we can think of for industry to invest. And without industry, I'm not so sure if public agencies under the situations we are in, uh, in the rest of the world, and not only in the United States. So, you know, what are we going to do? So, um, this is one of the things, probably several you can do that we've been doing with, with uh, pharmaceutical companies big pharma and little biotechs is that in that spectrum of upstream to downstream that I spoke about, it's the question of de-risking the company's efforts. So if a company makes a decision about whether they want to get involved in developing a new drug, they look at the investment they have to make and what the chance of what their uh, return is going to be. And if they're taking a risk on an unsuccessful drug, as we all know, everybody in the room knows, it's anywhere from 700 million to a billion dollars 
per intervention at a drug level. So what we've tried to do on the uh, upstream level is to provide for companies by things that we do on contract or all the time, research resources, sequencing and informatics capabilities, proteomic capabilities, clinical trial networks. We've just started a leadership group for clinical trials in antimicrobial resistance. And one of the reasons for that was to provide for companies the capability of doing clinical trials for new drugs. We've integrated TB into our HIV AIDS research networks. And again, that's TB with or without HIV. We just, you know, hopefully take, get as much TB mileage out of it as we can. So there are things you can do on that end of the spectrum. The other thing is that when we were dealing with trying to get companies involved with HIV, even when there's much, much more of a return on HIV drugs, even when you tier price it for the developing world, you've got to try and figure out what the companies really, really want. Um, what they really want is tax benefits, but even more so, they want extensions on patents. So you go to a company and you say, you have a blockbuster that's making you $4 billion a year. It's gonna cost you 700 million to a billion to fund a new TB drug. I tell you what, you go into the TB business and we'll extend your patent for another year on your blockbuster. So they wind up making three to four billion, that one of the billion goes away there. That sounds great, you do the math, it's great, except that somebody's gonna have to pay for that drug being an extra year being an expensive drug. Right. And the insurers are the ones that pay that and that's the wall you hit when you wanna make that suggestion. So I would not stop trying. One of these days we'll get a sympathetic ear, but that's... Peter, your reflections on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I alluded to Tools, I alluded to tools and, uh, and approaches, and I think these are, this falls in the category of approaches. How do we actually use IP and legal and business uh, practices, which were frankly developed in another space with another intention, and adapt them for, for, for promoting the global health agenda and TB in particular? It's something that foundations thought a lot with, about. I, I think right now what I'm particularly excited about are some of the branded uh, generics companies, whereas you, know, you can't get some big companies to touch a uh, 40, 80, 100 million dollar a year market. But there are other companies who are actually credible, very competent uh, manufacturers who will jump right in. So, so I think that that's another thing. And then it also becomes uh, a domestic product in some of our high burden countries, and, and that also, you know, gives it a lot of steam. Mm -hmm. Good. Eric, any thoughts? Um, you know, I think I agree with everything. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting towards the end of our, our, our hour. If there are any closing comments or questions? Yes, please. And we'll come back to our panelists for one, one last round of thoughts. So please jump in. Yes, please. Nula Moore with American Thoracic Society. So um, we've sort of, we've discussed this at different points today, but I think um, this last panel, you're maybe uniquely positioned in your, your various positions um, to try to come back to, so one of the central recommendations of the report, which is, you know, um, increased funding and, and prioritization, and maybe even just getting to the point where, you know, this big funding cut for, for USAID is not outlined every year. Um, you know, and there's a lot of advocates in the room. So, I mean, if there's any couple of central messages that we can use, and, you know, including this report, um, to try and make TB stick more and get that prioritization more, um, what do you think those would be? That's a great question to close the hour. Why don't we start with Eric, Tony, Peter, just sort of top line thoughts around messaging and communications themes and looking forward here. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I would focus on the fact that we know a lot about the natural history of the disease. We know a lot about the pathophysiology of the disease. We know a lot about the epidemiology of it. Uh, what uh, 
Uh, we know how to uh, uh, map and identify where individuals are within a population. Um, the uh, ability to uh, identify the individual, establish that they're infected, bring them into a relationship with a medical delivery system to cure them uh, is, I think, the critical piece that I would emphasize, matched with uh, the uh, inherent risk to the United States government uh, and its people with MDR and XDR TB, uh, and the importance of keeping uh, and helping our colleagues and country who are in front of that outbreak to be successful in containing it with the uh, elements of implementing it in their country because it will move across the border and come to our country. So I think that we know the science, we know how to uh, respond to it, uh, we need to uh, uh, help our colleagues and country who are burdened uh, with high burdens of disease to be excellent in their ability to do that. Thank you. John, you so I agree totally with, with Eric's message. My uh, contribution to the dialogue is that uh, in the multiple times that I've beseeched the Congress and the administration, I don't think I have ever gotten what I wanted the first time I asked, ever. It's like never, hey, what a great idea, Tony, let's do that. <laughs> it's, it's always been going back and back and back. So take word for word what Eric said, and you just got to keep going back and back and back because you, nothing gets done the first time around. You get the benediction. Oh, well, in the, in the presence of these guys, I'm not going to even hazard a guess as to how to talk to Congress. Um, I, I, but I know what, what compels me, and, and, and frankly, I get tired of the sky falling and, and the doom and gloom, and I know that motivates some people. But for me, I get totally energized by the successes that we've had in this field. And, you know, saving 22 million lives. And, and, and then the U.S. role in this, which is truly phenomenal. I just think about the gene expert, you know, and, uh, and I have a really close association with that because I myself got a gene expert when I was coughing from the air pollution in India. And ha after spending two weeks uh, <laughs> chugging cough medicine and, and quietly in self-denial, assuming that I'd contracted MDR-TB. <laughs> and I'll tell you, you know, the, the, the experience of thinking you have some TB and knowing you don't is a phenomenal thing that this government has enabled the world in. And, and there's no part of our government, as best I can tell, that hasn't touched it. I mean, I think DARPA put a lot of money into it. You guys put a lot of money into taking the DARPA <laughs> thing and turning it into a public health thing. You know, I think, uh, I think that, um, that USAID put a lot of money into making it an affordable thing. And, and, and I believe that CDC has done a lot in terms of like, how do you put that thing out there? And, uh, and, and OGAC has, has really put a lot of them, these things out there. So, I mean, here's a real thing that is changing lives. And that's a story that just hasn't been told. So I'd start with that. Thank you. That's a wonderful end point for this. Oh, please join me in thanking our speakers today. <laughs>